So I'd like to remind you of all the amens that I heard when I, you know, asked that we be taught patience. There was a lot of amens out there, so, you know, just, just a reminder. So when, you, when I begin to open up with a subject like the Trinity, um, I'm completely humbled because I want to ask you just one question when you think of the Trinity. Is it easy to conceive? that God, who's only one God, would decide to manifest himself in a community of three persons and to be able to still walk the line of only being one God and not three gods. That's, that's quite a line to be able to walk that only God can walk. But for us, with these puny, well, mine, with this puny little mind trying to put my hands around this, it's, it's not easy, and, it's, it, and it's, it's presumptuous and bold to stand here as a believer and say, I'm gonna teach you something about the Trinity today. Because when it came time for the Adventist church to teach, quote, about the Trinity, we have one fundamental belief about the Trinity, one, and it's about three verses long, and it's, after that, it's about a page long. <laughs> That's it. And we make it sound like if you get that, then you get the Trinity. I've been worshiping God for 35 years in knowing what I'm doing, kind of knowing what I'm doing, and I know this much about the Trinity. But here's what I know to begin with. Here's what I know. In Luke 9.35, there's a voice that comes from uh, the heavens, and we know that it's the Father because Jesus is already standing there. So the father comes from the heavens and says, this is my son, my chosen one. Listen to him. In Mark 10, 18, Jesus says to somebody who, who called him a good teacher, he says, why do you call me good? No one is good but God alone. And then in John 16, 13, which we'll look at probably in two weeks, when the spirit of truth comes, Jesus says, talking about the spirit, he will guide you into all truth, for he will not speak on his own, but will speak whatever he hears, and he will declare to you the things that are to come. So the Father, voices from heaven, saying, don't listen to me, listen to him. Jesus says, why do you call me good? There's nobody good but the Father alone. And then when the Spirit finally speaks, it won't be speaking of himself, he'll be speaking of Jesus. So the one thing I do know about the Trinity is that the Trinity is just like Jesus. No selfishness, no arguing, no one above the other. In fact, complete, absolute humility. That's one thing that I know about the Trinity. Out of all three though, which one is it that gives Adventists the most pause? Yeah, see, somebody's been worshiping longer than me and our head elder just spoke it right there. The one that gives the Adventists most pause is the Holy Spirit. Why? Why is it that, it gives, that he gives us the most pause is because he's the, he's the one we know least about or he, at least he's the one we pretend to know the least about. The thing that frustrates us about the Holy Spirit is that he can't be summed up in a doctrinal statement. He can't be summed up in a prophecy of 1260 days or 2300 days. He can't be crammed into a most holy place. And if we can't do that with God, then we have a problem. Because we've been called to tell people about God and we think we have to have information to give to people about the Holy Spirit. So he frustrates us. He frustrates us just a bit. So here in the Gospel of John, we've come to uh, chapters 14 through 17, and you may not be completely surprised for me to tell you that the Gospel of John gives us a completely unique look at the Holy Spirit. He speaks of the Spirit in ways that the other Gospels don't. And here's one of the reasons why I believe that the Gospel of John was written many, many years later is because John has had more days, if you will, more years, if you will, to live with this Spirit in him. He knows more, so he can tell us more. 
If you take a look back, John's already made clear the fulfillment of a lot of things in Jesus. One of the themes of the Gospel of John is that Jesus fulfills or replaces several things that have come before. Mostly feasts and aspects, if you will, of the law, the prophets, and of Judaism. In chapter 2, Jesus said he was the replacement of the purification laws, the waters of purification, and even of the temple itself. He is the replacement, if you will. He is the fulfillment, if you will. He, he completely uh, uh, replaces or fulfills the Samaritan faith that the Samaritan said that it must happen on a particular mountain. It must, ha- must happen in a particular way. And the Jews say, no, it has to happen in Jerusalem. Jesus says, He's, I've replaced those mountains. He is the Mount of Blessing. And one day you will worship not on a mountain, but in spirit and in truth. In chapter 5, he replaces the trumpets, if you will, at the Feast of Pentecost. In chapter 6, he is the manna. He is the bread that's come down from heaven. In chapter 7, he, he is the booth that gives everybody shelter in the wilderness. And he is the light of the world and the living water. What we've studied the last two studies in John 13 and 14, it's that there is a transfer of authority that's happening. That's the theme that Jesus puts forward to his disciples now. I need to transfer my authority because I'm going away. Remember he told them that he is going away and it's causing sorrow to them now. He's transferring authority. There are other times that this has occurred. This is not unprecedented for somebody to transfer their authority to be able to give way to a fulfilled mission, a replaced mission, if you will. It happened in Deuteronomy 34 and verse 9. It says, Joshua, the son of Nun, was full of what? Full of the spirit of wisdom because Moses had laid his hands on him and the Israelites obeyed him doing as the Lord had commanded Moses. Joshua is about to have authority transferred to him. He's about to do something for Israel that Moses could not do. And that is bring them into where? To end their 40 year journey and bring them into the promised land. Note, Joshua has to be filled with something in order to do that. He has to be filled with the Spirit. In 2 Kings 2, verse 9, it says that Elijah said to Elisha, tell me what I may do for you before I'm taken from you. The old prophet and the young prophet, his apprentice, he says, tell me what I can do. Please let me inherit a double share of your what? Of your spirit, he responded. You have asked a hard thing, Elijah says. If you see me as I am being taken from you, it will be granted. If not, it will not. Elijah said, it's not my spirit to give you. I do know this. If you see me as I'm taken away, then you can count on it. Elisha has asked for a double portion of the spirit as Elijah's successor. So in order for Elijah's authority to be transferred to Elisha, Elisha has to be filled with the Spirit. Both of those acts in the Hebrew Scriptures in Israel's history, though, are mentioned in Jesus' ministry. In John 1.17, Jesus, John says the law indeed was given through Moses. The first part indeed was given through Moses, if you will, Sam, Ralph, Grady, the covenant was given first through Moses, right? But truth came through, grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. There's a transfer, if you will, a transfer of authority, a fulfillment of a covenant. I'm careful with replacement, and in a couple weeks I'll tell you why. But yes, a replacement, completely fulfilled. And in Luke 1, 17, it says, with spirit and power of Elijah, he will go before him to turn the hearts of the parents to their children, the disobedient to the wisdom of the righteous, to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. The spirit and power of Elijah. Both of them are mentioned. The baptism of Jesus is John handing over his prophetic mantle. He must increase, John says. I must decrease 
When he baptized him, he handed it completely over to him, which brings us back to the voice. This is my beloved son. Listen to him. This gives us background into the work of the Holy Spirit in the Gospel of John. Just some background. It's necessary for Jesus to depart in order for the Spirit to fully come with power on the disciples. This is why he said, you'll do greater things than me. This has to happen, he said, just as it had to happen with Moses and Joshua, just as it had to happen with Elijah and Elisha. When it's time for the Spirit to be, for God to be revealed some more, something has to happen first. Transfer needs to take place. The power of the Spirit needs to inhabit somebody else. Might have been what the Mount of Transfiguration was all about. We do know there was a time in Jesus' ministry when all of a sudden he was transfigured. He was transfigured into his glorified form. And when they looked, they saw, it says suddenly two men. And who were they? Moses and who? And Elijah talking to him. They appeared in glory and were speaking of his departure for which he was about to accomplish at Jerusalem. That might be what this scene is all about. Moses representing the law. Elijah representing the prophets. Jesus is about to fulfill and succeed all the power that the law and the prophets give. He's about to become the embodiment of everything revealed about God up to this point through the law, the prophets, and the writings. That's exciting. So if we're to carry out this analogy in full, before John begins to teach us about the Holy Spirit and his work in his people, if we're to carry out this successing, uh, succeeding analogy, the true successor to Jesus then is not the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit does not succeed Jesus. And it's not just the disciples. They are not the true successors of Jesus' ministry. But the disciples incarnating the Holy Spirit now we have a transfer of power. See, the disciples are sad because Jesus said, I'm going away. In other words, you will no longer be in my physical presence. But he said, this has to happen. Because when this physical presence, pointing to his earthly body, is taken away, then the Father will give the Spirit to you. Your presence, incarnated by the Holy Spirit, will now be my presence unto all the world. Those songs that we sing about being maybe the only Jesus anybody will ever know are very, very true. There is no other Jesus to the people today except the one that lives in you and touches them with your body. This is the true succession of Jesus' authority and his ministry given to his disciples. And by the way, it was given to those 11 guys, they passed it on to who? They passed it on to us. The Holy Spirit's always been expected by Israel. Israel's always expected and that the Spirit would be brought by the Messiah. Several prophets said so, especially Isaiah. He says in several places. Our scripture reading was just one of them. In Isaiah chapter 11, it says that a shoot shall come from the stump of Jesse. In other words, a descendant of David, a descendant of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots. The spirit of the Lord will rest on him. The spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. We forget sometimes when we concentrate on the personage, if you will, the son of man part of Jesus, that it's the spirit that makes him the son of God. And it will rest on him. In Isaiah 61, he says that the Spirit of God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me. He sent me to bring good news to the oppressed, to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, release to the prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who what? All who mourn. The Spirit has this unique work in John. Unique work. John even gives it a unique name. 
John even gives him, the Holy Spirit, a unique name. It says, I will ask the Father, and he will give you another, what? Advocate to be with you forever. New Revised Standard, New American Standard. New American Standard says helper. New Revised Standard says advocate. King James Version says comforter. By the way, all three are equally right. In fact, we probably should use all three. I wish we did. I wish we did. But the Greek word is the word parakletos, which literally means called to one's aid or called to one's side. It combines two Greek words. The Greek word for call is kaleo, and the word then para is alongside, a paragraph, a parenthetical thought. It comes alongside in addition to, amen? So literally the Holy Spirit is a parakletos, one that comes alongside, one who's called to our side, one who's called to our aid. I will give you somebody to be called by your side. It has a legal connotation, yes. An attorney at a trial. He's the one who intercedes and appeals on behalf of another. John gives, a, gives it, yes, a strong legal connotation. It fits well with the description of the Spirit being a witness, being a helper, being an intercessor. When the advocate comes, he says, when the advocate comes, whom I will send you from the Father, the Spirit of truth who comes from the Father, he will testify on my behalf. His witness will then be ours because of the Spirit dwelling in us. What's amazing about this is that, is there any more powerful witness to somebody than them themselves? Jesus said, if you believe in me, if you just have a little faith in me, my Spirit lives in you. You're not a representation of me. It's as if you are me. Your witness your testimony is as perfect as his. One little timid amen here. But that's what he said, didn't he? He will testify on my behalf. And where is he? He's in you. And by the way, him living in us is what makes his testimony perfect to other people because we're just like other people. We don't claim to bring a heavenly testimony because we don't dwell in heaven. We bring an earthly testimony. We bring good news to this place in its flesh, in its uh, domain, if you will, in its own habitat. Jesus says, that's the testimony I want you to give. Son of man and son of God. It's the spirit who does that for us. It aids the disciples. As I pointed out in the King James Version, the advocate is also a what? He's also a comforter. It's also a comforter. He says, I will pray to the Father. He shall give you another comforter that he may abide with you for how long? And remember what abide meant, right? To be in you, to be with you, to be called along your side, and he will be with you for how long? As long as you are. As long as you and I are us, he'll be with us. And by the way, when we're resurrected, we're resurrected by his power. So yes, we will be with him forever. Beginning when? Yeah, technically, yes. But actually, beginning the day that you believed. The day that you came up out of the water up there. He's been with you. This is the spirit of truth, he says, whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him because he abides with you and he will be in you. I will not leave you orphaned. Yes, I'm going away and I understand that you're sad, but you will not be left as orphans. I am coming to you again. Not just in the future when he does return, but he said literally, now I'm leaving you my presence now. Man. 
we think we know something about the Holy Spirit. So let's look at these just a little closer then. Go back and take a look at these a little closer. I will ask the Father. He will give you another advocate to be with you forever. The Spirit of truth, he says, whom the world cannot know, cannot receive, not know, but cannot receive, because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him because he abides with you and he will be with you. Think of what that passage is saying. Greek has two words for another. There are two separate words when you say another thing in Greek. One is opposite. There is another that's opposite. And then there is another that's exactly alike. This one is the exactly alike. Alon parakleton. Alon, that word alos, is the same or similar. He says that this presence is the same as whose? It's the same as mine. There's no difference between the two. The Holy Spirit's presence is Jesus' presence. You want to know how Jesus is present in you, he says, it's the Holy Spirit. The other is, it's the world cannot receive this because he neither knows what? He neither knows him nor what? Nor sees him. You know when the world believes? Is when they finally see him and know him. Jesus has decided that when they see you, they will see him. If we begin to live as if Jesus is living in us, because he is, then the whole world will begin to what? Believe. If I be lifted up, I will draw all the world unto me. So there's a twofold purpose for the Spirit here. He gives the disciples a permanent divine presence. We are never alone. Never are we alone. He fulfills the promise of the Great Commission, enforces that without him, they can do what? Nothing. This is why without him we can do nothing. Our testimony, no matter what it is, our ministries, no matter what they are, no matter how loving they may be, no matter how charitable they may be, if he is not living in us, they are worth nothing. Actually, that's not true. Nothing to us. It'll always be worth somebody to feed them. It'll always be worth it to them, won't they? But to us, we then substitute his presence with the ministry. We substitute his presence with something else. And according to our Sabbath school lesson today, we've been doing it ever since the garden, haven't we, Sam? So he says, I will not leave you what? I'll not leave you orphaned. This is how Jesus comes to his disciples. This is how he will come to us. His physical, repla- his physical presence is replaced by his spiritual presence. You and I then provide the physical part. We're the physical part of his presence. We're the son of man part of his presence. It's how he comes to them, came to them. It's how he comes to us. But the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you everything and remind you of all that I've said to you. He teaches us all we need to know. The emphasis is on helping us remember Jesus' words, helping us live out Jesus' words. Anything we remember or not of the word, uh, anything that we remember or we do, anything that we teach, we owe completely to who? We owe completely to the Spirit. All of us. He doesn't speak of the Spirit again until chapter 15, but I'll jump ahead there real quick. When the advocate comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth who comes from the Father, he will testify on my behalf. Spirit of truth. Again, the language of the court. There's truth to be dug at. There's truth to be proven in a court of law. This chapter is, remember, you have to remember in chapter 15, it's all about the world who hates Jesus. It's all about those who will persecute him. If Jesus was hated and persecuted, he said, if, if they hate me, 
because of the Holy Spirit's presence in me, if they hate me because I love them with the power of the Spirit and of my Father, then if my presence is in you, then buckle up, they're going to hate you too. That's why we need to know this. That's why his disciples needed to know this in the last four chapters of his life, the night before he dies. He says, what you see from a distance tomorrow that will happen to me, what you see, buckle up. It's eventually going to happen to you. And remember, all 11 of those guys die martyrs' deaths except for the one that is writing to us right now. So anyone who faces this will have the advocate of truth testifying on his behalf. We've said that before, too. If we're thrown before a court of law and it's time to testify, we're to claim the promise of Jeremiah, don't worry, I'll put my words in your mouth. I'm with you. And the reason that you testify to this is because you've known me for how long? Again, you've known me from the beginning. And we could say, wait a minute, wait a minute, it wasn't us, it wasn't us. Jesus said, yes. It was these 11 guys, I understand. They were with me from the beginning. But because of their word and because of your faith and the testimony that I give you, you've been with me from the beginning too. And he's even gone further to say that you have a better experience than the guys that were with me from the beginning. Blessed are they who believe yet haven't seen So it's not, on, it's not in the place of our own testimony. His testimony becomes our testimony. Your history becomes his story. History, your history becomes his story. Because he's made us mine. He said, I've made you mine. My testimony lives in you. Not something to make up, not something you think people will want to hear. You there are people out there who will listen to us talk about God because they love us. And by the way, usually people love us when we're humble and when we're honest and when we're authentic and when we convince them that we're sinners just like they are. No one has ever won from a position of moral superiority. Jesus didn't use it, which, if you think about it, he is the moral superior, is he not? And yet he didn't use it, neither shall we. So the, pe- the Spirit's testimony encourages, corroborates, it becomes our own. The promise that bound Jesus' testimony is the same promise he gives to us. The Son of Man is bound to the children of man. That makes the children of man bound to God as the Son of Man is the Son of God. Because the Spirit needs one thing to do His work. The Holy Spirit only needs one thing to do His work. And what is it? He needs bodies. He needs somebody to incarnate. John the Baptist got discouraged. And he was so sure of his message that Jesus was the Messiah. He was so sure of it. But now he's doubting because he's rotting in Herod's prison and his death is imminent. So he sends his disciples to, say, to ask, are you really the Messiah or should I look for another one? Jesus' answer to him was, go and tell John what you've seen and heard. The blind receive their sight, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, the poor have the good news brought to them. Doesn't that sound like Isaiah 61? Isaiah 61, it said, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because the Lord has appointed me, anointed me. He sent me to bring good news to the oppressed, bind up the brokenhearted, proclaim liberty to the captives, release to its prisoners. Jesus on earth is the Spirit incarnate. You tell John what you've seen. The Holy Spirit has incarnated a perfect body and this is what's happening. Spirit doesn't do that. Disembodied. The Holy Spirit could be disembodied. He could just fly around it if he wanted to, right? He could fly around, do his power, but he's decided no. 
He's decided that he wants to be God's presence in each and every one of us. And the only way that he gets his work done is when he incarnates another body. First, the perfect human body of Jesus Christ. Next, everybody who will believe in him. Jesus had a body, a physical one. The Holy Spirit lived in it. Jesus said, now I have a spiritual body. You, the body of Christ, us, the church, and I will live in it as much as, I, as he lived in me. I will live in her. So he already said that he's there in the believer, but he's also in the world somewhat. We talked about this before. There is a measure of the Holy Spirit that's in everybody, no matter who they are. When you encounter any living person on this planet, how do you know that they are filled with the Holy Spirit? They're breathing. So it's almost God giving you a signal. Hey, before you judge this person, before you, you come to a conclusion about this person, I'm living in him and her. Hello, he's waving at you. Every breath waves at you saying, I'm present in them too. Don't get too uppity about this. Before you come to a conclusion about them, I want you to love them. And, one, and it, for no other reason, love them because I'm in them too, as I'm in you. I've given you something else, yes. I've given you faith, and your faith is in something else. I understand that. I understand that there's more of me, if you will, or a better uh, experience with me, if you will. But I'm willing to give it to them if you'll give it to them first. And what is that experience? To be loved as we have been loved. They will begin to believe when we what? When we love them. See, that's the only way you lift Jesus up. It's the only way that he lifted you and me up. He lifted us up saying, I love you. Now go love somebody else. But Lord, they are so hard to love. Jesus said, you're telling me? And he let me live, let me live and love through you, if you wanna look at it that way. But there isn't any shortcut to this. There is no other way. There is no other revelation of me. Go and what? Love. See, our scripture reading sounded a little bit like the others, didn't it, Grady? Sounded just a little bit like the others. Has kind of the same components, good news to the brokenhearted, even the blind seeing, right? Isn't something like that in there? Doesn't it say that? That says the Lord who created the heavens and stretched them out, spread out the earth and what comes from it, who gives what? Who gives breath, same word for spirit in Hebrew, by the way, who gives spirit, who gives breath to the people upon it and spirit to those who walk in it, if you will. I'm the Lord, I've called you in righteousness, I've taken you by the hand and kept you, I've given you as a covenant to the people, a light to the nations, to what? To open the eyes that are blind, to bring out the prisoners from the dungeon, from the prison who sit in what? Who sit in darkness. There's just one huge difference between Isaiah 1 and Isaiah 11. Is that in Isaiah 1 and Isaiah 11, that power, that spirit was given to the Messiah. By Isaiah 42, it's given to his people. Exact same spirit, exact same ministry. A promise. A thousand years before Jesus even walked the earth. My people will walk because his spirit is in them. His righteousness is in them. They've accepted my righteousness as a gift. And now that they have, they will set the world free. Because they will love and give righteousness as they have been loved and given righteousness to. The disciples are containers of the Holy Spirit. 
The Spirit plus the disciples are love. What is the one single sign that you've been baptized by the Holy Spirit? What is the one single sign that you have been baptized by the Holy Spirit? Because you speak in tongues? No. It's when you love as you have been loved. It's when all of a sudden, when you are baptized by the Spirit, it's all of a sudden when you uh, have some sort of feeling that you didn't have before when you went under that water and came back up. You know, I still hate that person, but every time that I do, my chest starts to hurt. What the heck is that? And he'll walk with us as slow or as fast as we have to walk. But his love will prevail in our lives and in the life of others. See, the Spirit didn't choose to fly around and just blow on trees. The Spirit didn't choose just to fly around and blow on the water so that there could be waves. Creation proves it to us. The Spirit hovers over to the waters. And every day, he began to create different ways for the Spirit to inhabit until he gets to that sixth day. When he gets to that sixth day, he begins to inhabit all these living creatures. They're furry. they fuzzy. They roll. They swim. They jump. Spirit says, this is good. It's cool. But then, then, God created Adam with his own hands and Eve by cleaving Adam in two and the spirit says there right there that's my dwelling the spirit finds a home and he stops he doesn't fly around in the air anymore we believe we kind of still believe that don't we 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 come to the house of worship like he's been floating around in here and we come in and we say hey fall on us fall on us Holy Spirit right now Sorry you've been, I, sorry we didn't turn the AC on for you all week, but you've just been floating around waiting for us to show up. No, the Spirit wasn't floating around in here. Spirit didn't get to this building until Tom and the next person came in and unlocked the doors. Now the Holy Spirit says, I'm here. So it's not so much, Lord, fall on us from the Spirit. Maybe it's more, Lord, reveal him from within. Because this is the one place, this is the laboratory right here. See, we're all believers. We all have this one thing in common. We all believe to a certain extent everything that I've said. We're all trying at least to love our neighbors as ourselves. We're all trying that, aren't we? We're united by that one thing. This is the laboratory. This is the experiment. Right here in worship with the same purpose is you and me trying to love each other. If we can do it with each other, then maybe, just maybe, we can do it in the mall. Maybe, just maybe, we can do it in our neighborhoods. See, but that's what makes worship special, is that here we are. All the signs and the giftedness, tongues, miracles, healings, all the things that the Holy Spirit can and will do in people, they are nothing, 1 Corinthians says. Without what? Without love. He wasn't floating around in here waiting to fall on us. He didn't get here until you and I got here. Now that he's here, now what? Opportunity to speak and talk and teach and learn about his love and to live it out with each other. That's why here, nobody misses the grace of God. If you believe in your Savior, then you take him with you wherever you are. The church's reach is wherever you are, not where our building is, not where our live stream goes. It's wherever you are. So the best advice that I could give you is Monday, just be you and trust him that his love will shine through you somehow. And if you can do that, if you can do that, we'll begin to win the world. You're not alone. 
You don't wake up each morning by yourself trying to sum up love for your neighbor, trying to sum up faith to believe in God. You wake up every day knowing he's in you and he'll do it all for you and with you because he's called to your side. He is your parakletos. So I thank him today for reminding us of that. And I thank him for each and every one of you, for a family to be able to do this and do this together. Thank you.